Hi, and welcome to the very first video series lecture by Professor Ibrahim. So, you're the network engineer for a company. Pretty cool, right? And you're responsible for this flat network shown here. And this flat network contains a router, the internet connection, the switch, and a couple users, Sally and Bob. Now, Sally and Bob belong to the human resources department. And Bob and Sally, if they would like, they can transmit this document containing confidential information, such as the employee salaries. Now, Bob can send it to Sally, Sally can modify it, and send it right back to Bob if she wanted to, right? So you're probably thinking in, uh, to yourself, well, wait a minute, that's very simple, right? Well, here's this network, and let's just review what a, a quick flat network is. A uh, flat network consists of every single node in the same network address. So, for example, the router has 172.40.1. Here's the network address, 172.40.0.0, with a subnet mask of a slash 16, and Sally and Bob can have an IP address within that network. So in the event that Sally and Bob want to talk to each other, then they would talk to each other with an IP within that network. Or even if they want to go out to the internet, they would reach this router. Now, it's very simple. Like I said, it's very simple. Bob, again, if Bob wanted to transmit this file to Sally, he would go through the switch, and Sally would send it right back to Bob through the switch as well. Now, this is a very flat network. So what if the company grew and hired an engineer named John? Now, as I mentioned, he's an engineer and he, because it's a flat network, everyone shares information, then John could just as easily be given this document called the employee salaries, containing the employee salaries. Now, that's a huge problem because John is an engineer and he doesn't have the rights to view this document. So if Bob wanted to send this file to Sally or Sally wanted to send the file to Bob, then it's very likely that John could intercept it. Now, also, Bob could send this file to John or John could try to retrieve it somehow. But because of the fact that he is an engineer, doesn't belong in the human resources department, this becomes a, a huge security risk and should be altered. Now, then you would ask yourself, well, okay, in a flat network, how do you isolate them? Because in a flat network, you remember, the switch is dumb. It's a dumb switch. All it does is sit there and take connections, just like Sally's connection, Bob's connection, and the connection from the router, right? So how the hell do you isolate it? Well, what you can do is you can combine the functionality of the switch and the functionality of the router to isolate these departments. And when you isolate these departments, what you'll be able to do is allow Sally and Bob to communicate with each other and the router and to the internet, as well as allow John to communicate with the router and out to the internet, all within the same pieces of equipment. So here is a better document that shows how to do so, okay? Now, in this diagram, you'll see that nothing has changed hardware-wise. There's the router, there's the switch, and you got a couple of users. So on the left, you have a network for the engineers and a network for the human resources department. Okay. Now, to configure these separate networks using the same equipment as mentioned earlier, you need to implement a technology called inner VLAN routing, otherwise known as routing on a stick. It's routing on a stick as you can see here, this network, VLAN 40 for the engineers, well, if they want to talk to the human resource department, guess what? They have to go through the switch. The switch has to traverse the router. And then guess what? The router has to go back through the switch and to the human resources department. So you're hinged at the router. but. The reason why you're hinged at the router is because of the requirement of isolating the engineers from the human resources department. 
Now, in the previous example, as you can see, the physical interface on the router has an IP address. As well as these other, Sally, Bob, and John, they can have an IP address, whatever you'd like, right? So, if Sally and Bob have an IP address within the same network of 172.40.16, then they'll be able to communicate with a router. But let's say we try to isolate John without making any additional configurations to the router or the switch. Your first inkling would be, okay, well, why don't we just give him a different network number? Well, you got to remember, because it's a flat network, if you gave him a different network number, such as... Um, uh, 172.41.0. whatever, he will not be able to communicate with the router or the internet. So what you need to be able to do is isolate the networks and subdivide the router such that it can be tailored for both networks. So here's the diagram again, and let's just review this really quick before we actually get into the nuts and bolts of the configuration. So as I mentioned in the previous diagram that the physical interface has an IP address, well, in InterVLAN routing, the physical interface does not have an IP address. The IP addresses will be on the sub-interfaces here. So, those are sub-interfaces. The sub-interfaces are virtual interfaces. They're not a physical interface, and they'll have the IP addresses on them. The IP addresses of these sub-interfaces, these physical or these virtual interfaces, will be responsible for the default gateway per network. So, for example, I said the engineering department is within VLAN 40, virtual local area network 40, and here's its network information, 172.40.16. And its default gateway, meaning in order to contact VLAN 50, he has to talk to the IP address 172.40.0.1. Now, take it one step further. The other network, the Human Resources Network, is 172.50.16. And his IP address is uh, 172.50.0.1. Now, what does that mean? Well, if host B in the human resources department wants to speak with host A in the engineering department, they have to traverse this IP address here, 172.50.0.1. So, let's get started. I have a simulator set up here. Um, you will be doing this on physical equipment. Everything is the same except for the interface names. So let's start off with the router. In the router, you're, in, you're initially in user mode and you're going to go into privilege exec mode and in turn go into global configuration mode. Let's give this router a name and call them New York. Okay. Then the very first step would be to go into the interface, the, interf the physical interface connected to the switch. I have it labeled there as Fast Ethernet 0 slash 1. The second thing you would need to do is create the sub interface. As you see in the diagram, it's Fast Ethernet 0 slash 1.40 and Fast Ethernet 0 slash 1.50. So, So I created the virtual interface, fast Ethernet 0 slash 1.40. Then I have to enable the encapsulation dot 1Q. Earlier I mentioned that the protocol we're using is IEEE 802.1Q, otherwise known as routing on a stick. Remember that hinge example, that elbow example that I gave earlier. So we're going to type in the command encapsulation.1q, and then if you type in a question mark, it's going to ask you, what is the VLAN ID? Well, the network number should be the VLAN ID. So I'm going to type in 40. Now I'm going to add in an IP address, and remember, the IP address should be the default gateway for that network alone. So it's 172. 
40, 0 0.1, and then specify a subnet mask. I said it was a slash 16. And then you need to enable the interface. Not only that, but then you need to go into the second physical interface and do the same exact thing. Encapsulation dot one Q, then specify the VLAN. And then assign a IP address to that host. And then go back into the physical interface, interface fast ether 0 slash 1, and then turn it on. Now you'll see some log messages that say, oh, this interface came up, this, this interface came up, so on and so forth. So if you run the command show IP interface brief, you'll see here your sub interfaces were created. Okay? And your physical interface is, is up and running. Okay. So what you did was you configured a trunk port on the router. You configured a trunk port on the router there. Okay. So now it's time to configure the switch. Very simple, very simple configurations here. So here's the switch. Let's go into privilege exec mode, then go into global configuration mode. Give this guy a host name, let's say New York. SW stands for New York switch. So the very first thing we need to do is configure this port, FA01, which is connected to the router, as a trunk port. So if you do FA01, and the easiest way to do that is switch port mode trunk. Now you'll get a log message. Um, it's just indicating that it's going through a spanning tree. That's, that's quite all right. And then... If you do show in trunk, you'll see that the port that you just configured is, um, is going through the process of being enabled as a trunk port. So there was also one other thing that I forgot, by the way. You also need to configure a, another interface for the native VLAN, for the native VLAN, and I'll explain that in a second. So encapsulation.1q1native. So what that says is the VLAN 1 is the native VLAN, which is responsible for passing all VLAN traffic. So. So now when you go back on the switch and you run that same command, show in trunk, that, that's the command you run, then you'll see that the switch is in trunk, uh, in a configure, in um, trunking mode for that interface. Second thing you need to do is create the VLANs. So let's go ahead and do that. We need VLAN 40. Let's give it a name. We said it was the engineering department. And then we need to configure the second VLAN, VLAN 50, and say that's the name of human resources. All right, so you created the trunk port, you created the separate networks, now you need to assign the physical ports to the network. So in the diagram here, I say that fast ethernet zero slash two on the switch is connecting to VLAN 40. So I need to go into interface configuration mode for that interface and then do switch port access VLAN 40. Now what that does right there is it assigns that port to VLAN 40. So network 40, in other words, network 40. So then I would need to do the same thing to to the other switch port connecting to VLAN 50. Switch port access VLAN 50. Okay, all is well. So now, um, I need to just go into the native VLAN interface and enable it, which is interface VLAN 1. And then the very last thing you need to do is 
configure the IP address on the hosts. Okay, so we said here that host A in VLAN 40 is 172.40.0.40. The subnet mask is already populated, and then the default gateway is 172.40.0.1. All right, so that's that host. And then we need to do the same thing for host B. For host B, his IP address is 172.50.0.50, and his default mask is 172.50.0.1. All right. All is well. So now, let's test this out. If this is done correctly, host A should be able to talk to host B, but through the router. He must traverse the router. He must go through the router. Instead of in the previous example, that because they were connected to the switch and there wasn't any segmentation done, then... Uh, all the traffic stops at the switch there. So what I want to do to test this out is I want to open up a DOS prompt on host A. And first I want to ping the router. I want to ping the default gateway. My default gateway for host A is 172.40.0.1. And I get some success there with the four replies. So now if I want to ping the, IP, the default gateway for the VLAN 50, I want to do ping 172.50.0.1. And I'm getting a reply from him as well. So now let's try to ping host B in that network by typing in ping 172.50.0.50. Okay, it took a little, uh, little time there for caching. And as you can see, I'm getting my replies. So now, if I type in the word trace route to look at to look at the hops trace rt, and then I type in the host b 172.0.50, you'll see all the hops it takes to get to what to that host. So I'm on host a, and look at the hops. The very first hop it says 172.40.0.1. Well, if you look back at the network diagram, who's responsible for 172.40.0.1? Well, it's the router. So host A, instead of hitting the switch and then going to host B, he has to go to the router and come back down and go to host B. So that, my friends, is routing on a stick. Very simple, very simple to do. And one thing I want to talk about is the native VLAN. I talked earlier in that... Um, the engineering department is VLAN 40 and VLAN 50, right? So what happens is in 802.1Q trunking, which is what we just did in a nutshell, um, the let's say in a scenario where host B wants to communicate with host A. Well, the very first thing would be is host B's message would contain the words VLAN 50. Then the then there is a bigger message. There is a bigger message that gets once it arrives at the router. Um, let's say this is all encompassing. This is all encompassing, and it's oh, VLAN. One. Okay, so now these are logically grouped. So when it arrives at the router, actually, what I want to do is let's say the message says VLAN fifty to VLAN 40 because what what that says is because what that says is host B in VLAN 50 wants to communicate with host A in VLAN 40 well so this message the original message is this first line here VLAN 50 to VLAN 40 and then a envelope gets put 
that message gets put into another envelope, and in that envelope is labeled VLAN 1. Now that message goes from host A or host B in VLAN 50, goes through the switch, is arrived at the router. The router says, oh, okay, I received the bigger envelope. Let me open up the envelope and look at the message. The message says VLAN 50 to VLAN 40. And because we configured the VLAN 40 interface, it now knows how to transport it to VLAN 40. And the, the reverse is the same exact thing. If host A in the engineering department wanted to talk to host B in the human resources department, he would first apply a message that says VLAN 40 to VLAN 50. That message gets put into a envelope, and on that envelope will have a label of VLAN 1. That VLAN 1 is considered to be the native VLAN, meaning all other VLAN traffic, all other VLAN traffic will have to be relabeled as VLAN 1 before it can talk to another VLAN. So, for example, if you want to send a letter from, you know, New York State to an address in Mexico, first it would go through your state post, you know, your local post office, and then at some point, it, you know, it has the address from you to the residents in Mexico. Now, once it's received at the post office, a.k.a. the router in our example, the post office will put some sort of label on it that says, hey, this, belong, this is going to Mexico, and I've already given it the seal of approval to, you know, it has, it's, it's checked through, it's got the right number of stamps, so on and so forth. So that once it's received at the router, they will take out that envelope and look at the letter and say, okay, it has to trans transport to the destination. So, oh, do that. So that's what a native VLAN is. So again, if VLAN 50 wants to talk to VLAN 40, that gets put into an envelope. That gets put into another envelope, um, which is called the native VLAN. Now, by default, the native VLAN is VLAN 1, which could be changed, which could be changed. So, whereas in the previous example, in the previous example here, there aren't any notions of VLANs here. There aren't any notions of VLANs. So, if Bob wanted to talk to John or Sally, they would talk directly through the switch. But again, the requirement was to isolate John from Sally and Bob because he doesn't belong in the human resources department and therefore he wouldn't gain access to specific resources that Sally and Bob have. So, and in order to do that, you have to implement IEEE 802.1Q trunking, which supports the concept of a native VLAN. And remember, an analogy for the native VLAN is the native VLAN is an envelope within an envelope. So if this message is VLAN 50 to VLAN 40, then in order for VLAN 50 to communicate with VLAN 40, then it ha that message has to get put into another envelope, another envelope called the native VLAN envelope. And once the router receives it, the router will see the bigger envelope remove it, and then send it off to host, you know, the host in VLAN 40. Now, why does it have to do that? Well, you remember in a flat network, every port on the switch become, belongs to a specific VLAN, one and only one VLAN, right? So, for example, let's say this port on the switch connected to the router, if it was a part of VLAN 50, ask yourself this, well, will that engineer in the VLAN 40 be able to talk to the router? The answer is no, because 
The engineer is a part of VLAN 40, but this port is assigned to VLAN 50, so he can't talk. But one way he could talk is if you implement IEEE 802.1Q trunking and put his message in an envelope, which is also called encapsulation. So the technology encapsulates the original message in another message that's called the native VLAN and it arrives at the router and sends it to the destination after it strips off the native VLAN. Well, that's all I have for today and good luck and have a good day.